I'm Jim Galloway. I've been connected to Clinch Haven Farms for a number, number of years. Uh, I came back out of the service, and Mr. T. Terpster, the owner, he approached me with a position, with a proposition. He had no heirs, and if I would uh, come in with him, he'd give me an option. Later on, maybe I could end up owning the farm. And uh, co the coal fields were shutting down, and I thought, well, at least I'll get over where I'll get all the milk I can drink anyway, me and the kids will. And so we had a long relationship, and uh, the old gentleman, I learned a lot from him, and, and I enjoyed my time at, with him. And, and uh, he, he was a knowledgeable man, and, and, and he was ahead of his time, I guess, uh, trying experiments. Uh, I said he had a good relationship with BPI. He was eager to try anything that they uh, suggested. And that's the reason we got into growing some alfalfa and stuff. They, he proved to them that you could grow it in loose, sandy soil. So we went on down through the, and at that time we was considered modern, you know, of course we, by today's standards, we'd be considered obsolete. But uh, he had a good herd build up. He is recognized as one of the better dairymen throughout the state. And uh, we went to a lot of meetings and he was always uh, called on for his comments and they, people seemed to value his knowledge. He was a native of Friesland. He, he was raised in a dairy country. He came over here as an electrical engineer and worked at Dorchester for Old Dominion, and, and he ended up after the depression uh, down there on the farm, and, and he made a go of it. Contrary to what people thought, he was too stubborn to give in, and he made it. And uh, from that day on, uh, he had no desire to for anything but his farm and his cattle. He loved his cattle now. That was his favorite thing was his dairy cows. And uh, he got into the milk producing uh, bottling business out of uh, necessity. He had to market a little milk, and and he uh, started uh, with the Stony Coat Coke. Uh, Stony Coat and Coal Company gave him a business in their company stores, and then he distributed up through Norton and Wise. And, and uh, as it went on, why we gradually increased. So at one time we had about. 30 employees altogether. And then later on in life, here came the private label and, and the big contracts, and nobody's at home. Retail delivery is gone. There was no way to survive. So I shut the milk plant down after I owned it and uh, just produced milk from the milk and herd. Yeah. Okay, anything else you want to tell us now? Well, I don't know, not unless you su suggest something, you'll have to hit me a little bit. Okay. Uh, so, you came uh, to Clinch Haven Farm after World War II? Is yes. that when you started? Yeah. And uh, you were in service during World War II? Yeah. Uh, what, what branch were you in? I, I was in the uh, uh, 8th Air Force overseas. I was in the Army Air Corps. I flew B 17s out of Barry St. Edmunds, England. And, uh, and after uh, I came back from over there, I was in the various things, the ferry command and the transport command. And uh, when I got out then, I, I well, I got, I was married and had a kid, and the wife, she kept on, you come home, you know. I liked it in the service. I'd, I guess I'd have been there yet if it had kept me, but uh, she put the pressure on me, and I came out. Okay, you ready to review this? Yeah, Any time, but you all have to help me. I'm a, I'm a novice at this. Well, we certainly appreciate you coming up. Well, I'm so glad to do it. Okay, just tell us what you're saying. Well, as one of the employees that uh, he worked out collecting and soliciting business, he's coming in to work this morning. See the some of the employees' cars parked there, and the, that house there on the corner belonged to the herdsman. He he was the man in charge of the dairy herd, and I ran the milk. Plant. 
There's a picture of our silo, the one of the first uprights of that size that we built. We built two or three more later on, but that one, well, that was the first one. It hold, oh, about six, seven hundred tons, I guess. I don't remember exactly. It's a 45 by 14. And there's a her, our dairy cows grazing out in the lush pasture producing milk. They produced it while I slept, and then the next morning we'd take it away from them. Hmm. But about what year was this? This is along approximately, I'd say, along about 56, 58, because we went on a, a tank pickup in 1960 and did away with the milk cans. So it had to be just prior to that time. I, and I went over and along 52, so it must have been about 56, 58 when the boy made that. We made that film he, to show to the civic groups in the schools. He'd take it around to various uh, civic groups and the various little schools, and this, they all seemed to enjoy it, especially the children in school. There we were preparing, preparing the seed bed to sow alfalfa. Uh, alfalfa had to have a good seed bed. It had to be thoroughly packed and worked, and, and uh, you had to have the pH right and the fertilizer and all put in. And uh, it took several trips over with tractors, you'd, uh, first you'd, uh, d you'd disc and cull the pack, and then you'd come back with a cedar with a cull the packer on it. To, uh, there, of course, is a disc preparing the soil, and, and that drag harrow leveling it behind it. But uh, there comes a, a cull the packer that packs the soil down and makes it firm so you can get a good seed bed. And there the boy comes sowing the alfalfa seed to a brilliant cedar. That, that seed came down between the two rows. One made a little groove and the other covered it up. And uh, that uh, was uh, secret to getting a good stand of alfalfa. It is a good seed bed preparation. And there's the boy, one of the first, I guess one of the first bush hogs that's ever around. And, on the crawler. We used that on the rough, steep places that uh, mow with. And uh, I, I, I would almost say that was probably one of the first bush hogs ever came in this country. And uh, you could uh, kind of run over rough ground with it. And you had that crawler with tractor, you could get over steep places. There's the man before we started si cutting our insulates to go in the silo. There's a tractor pulled the cutter and the chopper there and it blew it back into the wagon as a single row cutter and the tractor handled it quite well and, and uh, the corn was chopped fine and, and uh, you take the whole plant, you take every bit of the plant and the leaves and the grain and chop it real fine so it'll pack good. If, you, if it's not chopped fine it won't pack good in the silo. And the, if you get air in there, you'll have spoilage. That shows how fine he's chopping it. He's doing a real good job on that load. And then as soon as he gets that load, uh, that wagon loaded, why, the boy will change it out and put and give him another wagon, and then he'll take that in and uh, and unload it and blow it into the silo. They, it goes quite pretty fast if you don't have any breakdowns and everything or no flats or something. And uh, it's the most nice work, that silo on there, because uh, back in the old days, you had to haul it in all the whole stalk and then chop it, and that was a lot of work. And after we got that self, that, that self chopper and blowing it in the, the wagons, that took all the hard work out of it. Back in the old days, you cut it down with a knife, load it up and fed it in by hand. Now, that was an ordeal. That shows him unloading it into the silo. That was had a gravity unloader. They had a big blower there, and on one side you had to vacuum. It sucked the silage in and it discharged it on the other, and it blew it up into the silo. And uh, kind of like a big vacuum cleaner. Yeah. Uh, uh, we used that for a few years, and then we got one that just uh, unlo you unloaded out of the wagon into it and didn't have to do that because that had took a big engine and. Uh, it's a very expensive thing to run. It's hard on fuel. 
And then uh, we did away with that and just got one that, where the wagon would self-unload right into the blower. And, the, and that made it uh, a lot easier than that. That, that was kind of work there. That thing would whip you around. I know I told the boy one day, let me unload the load. And I got started and he's whipping me. And I said, here, take this thing. I got to go make a telephone call. <laughs> I had to get out of that thing. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was easy. It looked easy. See how easy it looks there? Then we, after we got a silo full, we was producing more, and we didn't have any more storage, so we uh, dug out that trench silo, they call it. Now, uh, the four, as the forerunner of the bunker, now people use it as a bunker silo. They concrete the sides and the bottom, and you, it's so much cheaper to build an upright anymore. The cost of an upright is prohibitive for what uh, amount of storage you get. You don't get enough capacity for your money. So I don't know if anyone's building uprights anymore. They all went to big bunkers. And they'll pack them bunkers tight and put a plastic over it and it'll keep real well. And that that one, we just dug a hole in the ground to have some place to put what corn we had. We had more than we had a silo and later on we built some more silos. We only used that bunker there out that trench, I believe one year is all we ever used it. It's still down there up there on top of the hill. And that boys, he's a packing it good and tight with that little crawler tack, a tractor. You had to pack it tight or you'd have so much spoilage that you'd lose it. And as the Mr. D. Terpster himself out overseeing it, he's, uh, he's come out and he's overseeing the operation. And uh, watching it blow in there. He uh, took a great interest in his farming now. He, and uh, after that, there he is with, one, with his little dogs and uh, one of the employees there. Uh, they're discussing something. I couldn't tell you what they're discussing, but I'm sure. There comes the cows across the road. I was, uh, this day and time, I'd hate to think about trying to bring them across the road, but back then there wasn't too much traffic. People knew it. If the car did come down, he'd stop. Now they'd run right on through you, I guess. But we was milking there in the stanchion barn. As for we got the parlor up on the hill. And the cows, they, oh, they, they're habit-forming creatures. There's no trouble to get across. If one wandered off a little, she'd come back, so you didn't have to worry about her going anywhere. And uh, see, there's one coming back now. She went out to look around a little, I guess. And that's, just, that's the barn where we got this farm supply store in now. And that's the boy, he'd been over the, on the ridge to get him in his Jeep. And as a driver going out to make his deliveries, he waving, he worked Norton. Who else did he? And uh, about everybody in town knew him. Uh, uh, they've got the cows in the stanchions. Uh, then they went in, each one of them went into a stanchion and was locked up. And they'd groom them a little before milking time. And the cows had learned their stanchion. And if one got a, in the wrong one, they'd be, she'd stand there and wait till you got her out so she could get back in her place. Didn't take but just a few times till they learned where they were supposed to be in that barn. That's where he strip cup, we call it. To you. Uh, take a few s streams of the milk out to see that there's nothing abnormal in it. And uh, you do that each time, and uh, there he's put a little on a test pad to see that there's nothing, there, no mastitis or anything that. There he took a surge milker off, and he took it off and poured it in a bucket, and then, and then he'd weigh the milk. There he's on the scale. He'd weigh the milk and record each cow's production, and after that he'd have to carry it into the milk room. Well, I get back there where he's cleaning the udders. He washes them with a little disinfectant before he puts the machine on them. And uh, there he's uh, pouring that milk. That's what that cow gave. And he, that's a, what they called a bucket milk. That uh, was suspended over from a surcingle over their back. Now, by the latter years, you just went directly into a pipeline and carried it in. There he recorded the weight, and now he's pouring it up in the cooler, and that's a big ice bank in that cooler there, and the milk's 
flows over the cooler and goes into the cans and it's cool. You try to get it cooled down below 40, it's 